Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. I'm really like, uh, happy to sit, uh, stand here to share our topic, how to bring the data locality in the Kubernetes cluster. And I'm Zoe, actually, as uh, interest, uh, introduced, uh, like I'm the core maintainer at Alashu, and I started working with this project since 2016. Uh, and nowadays, I also take some responsibility to do the product manager uh, to build a roadmap for this project. So hello everyone, um, I'm very excited to be here. And then today uh, I'm Chen Wang, from, uh, I'm a staff research scientist from IBM Research. And uh, on my part, I contribute to open source community a lot. Involved, uh, I, I've been involved in like Kubernetes autoscalers, uh, Kubernetes scheduler plugins, and uh, some sustainable projects that we'll talk on Thursday uh, called Kepler. And then besides that, I have um, my, my research interests mainly lie in two sides. One is trying to use the machine learning to improve the resource management and system management uh, on Kubernetes. The other side is I try to improve Kubernetes platform to support better machine learning and uh, AI workload. So uh, I will start with a brief background and uh, what is uh, why we started this problem as a research problem. Uh, so Kubernetes is, is actually a natural fit for running AI and ML workloads for a lot of reasons. So it can help you to scale to meet the resource requirements for your AI and ML training and production inference workload. It gives you better support on continuous development, which is by nature required by AI and ML workload. And then it helps you provide an abstraction layer that allows data scientists to access services without worrying the underlying uh, infrastructure. It provides you high availability field over protections uh, that will impact your SLA and uh, resilience problem. It allows the AI ML operations to operate across public clouds, private clouds, on-premise uh, infrastructure, and also include secure air gap locations. And it also gave you a consistent platform for different stages of your AI and ML workload, including pre-processing, training, and production inference. And uh, in addition, we have all types of uh, uh, open source tools uh, available on, uh, uh, to be used on Kubernetes, include, including like Argo workflow management, Kubeflow, Ray, and TorchX, et cetera. So when you start running a pipeline of uh, data analytics workload on a machine learning pipelines, uh, on Kubernetes, there are a lot of questions coming into your mind, like, uh, where do we store our data permanently? Where can we cache our data in Kubernetes temporarily? And then where do we place paths given the data locality we know in clusters? And then how to distribute and load the data fast enough so we improve the overall cluster resource utilization? And uh, how we scale resources upon like data volumes, when the data volumes becomes really big, how we uh, scale resources upon that. And then what APIs we should use to get those data into our computing paths, right? And how to guarantee the persistence and resilience of your data when, um, like, like for example, your computing paths are completely gone. And how do we forward data between different stages of your pipeline, and then how do we manage the whole life cycle of data uh, in Kubernetes. So in Kubernetes, we actually don't um, have a lot of support of those questions, and we don't either have the uh, isolation and the data security guaranteed among tenants in the same cluster. So we will, uh, I will cover uh, several questions of those, and uh, then we will present you what's available in open source community. So we start all the study based on uh, uh, building a simple benchmark uh, workflow uh, workload called, uh, we build the benchmark based on the existing monolithic uh, Tesseract um, uh, application. So Tesseract is an open source optical character uh, recognition engine. Uh, it, it's used to, to, to it's a very popular open source application, but it's monolithic. We try to um, 
decompose it into different microservices, into two types of benchmark, and then we did all those uh, evaluations and experiments based on this, uh, this benchmark. So as I mentioned, Tesseract is a complete workflow of um, um, machine learning pipeline. It includes different process, like it, it reads the, 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 the TIFF image in, and the, it does the recon recognition stage with finding the lines and uh, uh, running all those machine learning um, inference to recognize words uh, and detect the paragraphs. And then we build two uh, benchmarks based on this. You can check more details in our published papers in uh, Cloud 2021. And then the cost grant benchmark include five microservices for different stages of the tasks. And then the fund grant include uh, 11 microservices. And the, the, we use in two types of input data to generate different size of the input for the whole machine learning pipeline to run on Kubernetes. And so our environment setup includes three workers of uh, um, um, for the uh, three nodes, for the worker nodes, uh, with the 32 gigabytes of memory, eight CPUs, uh, 50 gigabytes of disk space, and we also use one NFS server deployed in the same rack of the cluster to emulate uh, the data access pattern uh, as the cloud object storage. And we will have some results on the cloud object storage as well. And um, so the maximum uh, I.O. speed we have in, uh, is like 17 gigabytes um, per second for, for the memory and the 175 megabytes for the disk access and then the network connection is 10 gigabytes. So, so when you want to load the data to your computing pods, there are several options intuitively. So you can directly read the data from cloud object storage or NFS server, or you can mount the data in the local volume for the, uh, from the disk or from memory. And then we basically evaluate the speed to get the data. And then uh, those are some results, like we read from local memory, local disk, from uh, uh, local persistent volumes, or we load it from the NFS server. And we can see over the different size of the data, the maximum speed up we can get, uh, the, the bandwidth throughput improvement we can get uh, over the remote read and write uh, can, can be improved up to 4.41. Um, bandwidth throughput in increase, so meaning you, 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 need, you need much less time to the load the data when the data is already uh, in your local volume. And then we also compare the local disk, local memory read and write to versus the object storage. And then for different sizes, you can see maximally we can get almost a 10x performance improve. And uh, minimum, you will get like at least a two uh, for the very large data size. And then all of those loading time in your cluster for your workload uh, will take your resources. And at that time, you're not completely using the resources, so you would end up with a very low utilization on your expensive GPU resources. So, the second question, if we assume we can load all the data in the cluster, do the prefetching, and then what, uh, what we can do about those data when, uh, for example, at the platform layer in Kubernetes. So where we put, uh, schedule, or place our paths in Kubernetes. So in this experiment, uh, we have uh, two setups. One is a local setup, which is we try to place all the paths using the data on the single node. The other is we try to map the doing some, something like load balancing, the default scheduler will do, uh, which is try to um, spread the path across node in a round robin fashion. And then at this time, we would just want to uh, take a look at the I.O. time it takes. And then, for example, we did some experiments on uh, one page input or 10 page input for both the uh, cross grain uh, benchmark and fund grain benchmark. And then you can see the, uh, the maximum improvement can up to five times. Uh, so the, uh, the seconds, the time you spend uh, to read the data using the local storage can be five times faster than using the remote storage. 
And then uh, this experiment shows the end-to-end -end processing time of the whole workflow. And then for the cross-grain uh, benchmark, we can see the maximum input can be four times if you try to consolidate all those parts using the data on the same node. And then if you develop some data-centric uh, solutions, meaning you try to place a parts to reduce the inter-node data movement, then uh, the improvement is also like, um, like around four times or three times, at least. So next, when you, when, when you run uh, very large workflows in your clusters, you need to transfer data. There are a lot of intermediate data between stages. You want to get the uh, output of the st stage one and forward the data to, uh, the, 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 to stage two. And then how can you forward data? Uh, between stages in workflows and pipelines. And then similarly, the, uh, the, the simple solution is we read and write to a remote, remote story. And then this serves as our, our baseline, uh, showing the NFS read and write. And the other solution is we cache the data locally in the uh, local disk or local memory. And then we can see for different sizes of the data, as the uh, data size gets larger, the speed up can goes up to uh, 1.4 times. And then if we do something like direct data forwarding, so we don't store it, we, we just enable data communications between parts, um, and then the, the speed up can further be uh, 2.5x. And then, of course, we have some start. We started like if you want to enable da uh, direct data forwarding, there is a trade-off between the, uh, the uh, between the resource usage and the transfer time, the performance you want to achieve, and you want to determine an optimal buffer size so you uh, you don't use a lot of resources, but at the same time you achieve the good uh, performance for data forwarding. And for this, we build a framework called Flocky. And if you want to know more details, check out this publication. So the end result of enabling direct data forwarding for different uh, patterns of data transfers, like one to one, one to n, n to n. And then those are the results. And maximally, we can improve the speed up up to, uh, for example, 60 times. So enabling data forwarding in, uh, in the pipeline is important. Of course, it uh, will significant, significantly reduce the end-to-end -end execution time of their whole machine learning pipelines, but you would also lose the persistence of the intermediate data once the part is done. So it's very good, direct data forwarding is very good for um, stages like it doesn't take a long time for, uh, for computing or processing, but it loads a, a large amount of data. So then I will pass the uh, slides to Shou Wei, and he will introduce more available open source tools to solve those problems. Yeah, thank you for sharing uh, about the result of the benchmark. And I will give the real solution how we can solve this kind of data locality problem uh, with our open, soft, uh, open source software called Alashu. Uh, first, I want to give a short uh, introduction what is Alashu. Actually, we are the open source project start from the uh, UC Berkeley AMP lab since 2014. And uh, nowadays, we already have like more than 1,200 contributors uh, in our community. And actually, we are very active at Slack and welcome to join us and uh, solve the problem together. And uh, what is Alashu? Actually, we are the virtualization layer uh, between the compute and the storage. Uh, and at the same time, actually, we're also the uh, catching layer to like help you to ignore the data locality problem uh, in any st stack and uh, any environment. Actually, today, because actually we talk about the locality, actually we're mostly focused on the catching uh, capability from the Alashu. Yeah, Chen uh, mentioned that there are a lot of uh, different problems. How can we bring the data loca the locality in the Kubernetes environment? And I will try to answer most of them uh, in my uh, deep dive. Uh, first of all, I, I want to give some basic introduction. What is the performance bottleneck uh, in the machine learning data processing? Actually, uh, 
in general, this is very typical uh, machine learning data processing pipeline. Actually, you will load the data from the under layer storage. It can be the cloud storage, on-premise storage, object store, and even the local disk. Actually, you want to load this data into your CPU memory, and afterward, you want to do some pre-processing, like you want to resize your image, and you want to uh, uh, clean this kind of data. Then, I, then you feed this kind of data from the CPU memory to the GPU memory or TPU memory uh, to do the further training uh, with the uh, machine learning algorithm. And uh, But actually, there are several points here. The first of all, when you load the data from the under layer storage to your memory, actually there have a lot of problem called fetch store. Most of the time it's IO bound because actually uh, your storage cannot provide enough IO bandwidth uh, to the CPU memory. And afterward you will see like uh, you will see the uh, prepare uh, store actually is uh, a CPU performance bound and afterward you will see uh, because of your uh, algorithm or because of your characteristic of your workload you always see a uh, CPU bound there. And if you want to see uh, more analysis actually there is a one very good uh, reference on the layer from the MSR actually they give a lot more explanation there. And this is uh, also very typical, like uh, people how do how they do like uh, machine learning training uh, in their environment. Actually, from the left side, you can see there can be like object store, uh, disk, or even like uh, very traditional data house, data warehouse with HDFS cluster. And the right hand, because of the benefit of the Kubernetes uh, allowed you to do the multi-tenancy, uh, fine granularity. Uh, control of the resource. Actually, people always doing like machine learning training in the Kubernetes environment. And uh, previously, like you want to directly access the data from the object store. You can copy, do the rep data replication from the storage system to the uh, training data, which will involve a lot of manual work, including the replication and the data validation. And you also, you have to guarantee the data prone at this process. Actually, it's uh, caused a lot of difficult problems there because uh, there's no data scientists really want to deal with this kind of uh, dirty work from the data pipeline. And also it's uh, really delay the uh, delivery of the product. And another problem is actually, as Chen mentioned before, if you directly query from the uh, under layer object storage or this kind of file system, actually performance is very bad. It's not only about the IO throughput uh, between storage system and the training cluster. Actually, it's also about the metadata operation, like uh, list schedules, get schedules. It's also very uh, like slow from this kind of uh, uh, system. So actually, we are thinking about, uh, yeah, actually, because there is no data locality guarantee uh, from this kind of architecture. So actually, we have to bring it back. Otherwise, your GPU utilization is always very low. It will be, it can be like 10% or 20% uh, from the real production environment. And actually, it uh, will cost a, cost a lot of waste because actually, you know, like GPU single node can be 30 or $60 per hour. Actually, you just uh, utilize uh, one fifth of this uh, resource. Actually, it's uh, a big waste of money there. And afterward, like uh, we come up with idea. So uh, let's see, we have to bring this uh, uh, intermediate later layer into this kind of architecture. So the first of all, we are thinking about what kind of interface should we provide to this kind of uh, uh, company framework. No matter it's Tosh, TensorFlow, or even like uh, MTANet, this, this MXNet, this kind of framework. So we do a lot of investigation and we found like uh, no matter which data loader you are using, they always have some uh, thing called they will use local file system. <laughs> actually, because a lot of people when they do the development, actually they were not uh, considered to use like a data loader uh, compared with the cloud storage or data loader compared to the HDFS this kind of file system. But they always use the POSIX interface. So first of the answer to it is actually we also develop uh, the POSIX interface uh, with uh, the Elijah fields to provide the best uh, capability to serve this kind of uh, training model. And uh, the second problem, how we can bring the data locality back into this architecture? First of all, we will have the cluster, a cluster level locality at the left side, which means you can ignore uh, where the under uh, storage is. It can be storage, uh, like uh, uh, 
cloud storage at the same region, cloud storage at the different region, and also it can you can access data from the uh, cloud fr to your own promise data center, which even a geo dispute uh, data center, which have very high latency. This is uh, the left part actually is guarantee this part of the locality. The second locality actually is uh, we want to also bring the locality back to the node level because you know like even you bring back this kind of locality from the remote uh, storage to the local storage, you still want to say like uh, it's a lot of uh, performance difference between you access the local uh, compared to the remote like uh, distributed file system. So actually the second part is we will co-locate our Alasio Fuse port together with the uh, uh, machine learning uh, training port to make sure like we can uh, catch the metadata at the Alasio Fuse uh, side and also catch the data from the Alasio client side to serve the best performance for the machine learning training. And uh, another thing is like, uh, because actually we are catching there, we, we are, the Alasio itself will not never guarantee the persistent uh, for the data, which means when you write the data back or you access the data, we will not uh, guarantee like you will not lose the data because we always do the invasion if uh, the caching space is uh, insufficient. So at the under layer, we will write back the data to the uh, under layer storage. It can be the cloud storage or on-premise storage system to guarantee this kind of persistent. And when you get the performance, the temporary data is stored in the Alasio uh, space. Uh, the big problem here is like, uh, although we have this, ki this kind of caching system, but you know like if you don't know any access pattern of your machine learning processing, you always to say like, uh, what, what if the first time? Uh, the first time always very slow. When you do the fourth epoch, it can take forever to load the data from the cloud storage or the remote uh, uh, object store. And uh, we say like, okay, uh, we provide a way for you to do this kind of prefetch. We call it distribute load in our system. First of all, you can initialize the distribute load command from the Alasio client to the Alasio master. The Alasio master will aware, oh, okay, I need this kind of data from the under file system. So we'll load the data first from the uh, cloud storage into Alasio worker. So which means it's overcome the first remote fetch from the remote data center or the cloud storage. Then second, actually the Alasio fuse uh, pod will passive fetch the data when, I mean, when the machine learning pod will want to access this kind of data, it will catch the metadata at the Alasio fuse pod. And also at the same time, it will also catch the data uh, after the first time you access the data uh, from the machine learning job. And afterward, uh, we will uh, feed the data into the uh, machine learning training pod and this data will resilient in the uh, CPU memory or the GPU memory. Okay, the last problem we want to answer, because actually machine learning job actually it itself have the life cycle, man, uh, life cycle uh, characteristics. Actually we want to see how we can manage this kind of life cycle of the data in a Kubernetes environment. Uh, at the beginning actually we use the sidecar mode to manage all this kind of data, but uh, afterward we realized it's not the best way to do it. So we adopt uh, the uh, CSI, which means the container storage interface to provide a better uh, lifecycle management of in the Kubernetes. The problem of the sidecar mode, actually, we will launch the Alasio fuse pod from the node server. When the node server have some problem, actually you have to restart your application pod and also same as the Alasio fuse pod uh, to restart the whole service. Actually, it's not so friendly. Uh, no matter for your daily maintenance, also it's about like when you want to upgrade this kind of service, they uh, actually they're like hard binding so actually it's not very friendly to the uh, data scientist. But uh, afterward, we find that uh, it's better way to use CSI. When you launch the, when you launch, launch the uh, uh, application pod, actually we will also launch the Alasio fuse pod from the CSI component at the first time. And we also mount the TV into this two pod to provide the uh, data in the local machine. And at the same time, if you launch more application pod uh, in the same, same host machine, actually you, the only thing you need to do is like launch more application pods uh, with mounting this kind of persistent volume uh, into this container. Yeah, and afterward I want to say, share some results of what uh, will happen after you adopt this solution uh, in your production environment. 
I would not say this is the best case to show the performance because we show we see much better performance uh, in the environment. But this is very typical, like average use cases uh, for the real production environment. As you can see, uh, when you load the data directly from the object store, uh, you can see here actually it has very low GPU usage. Uh, the maximum GPU usage after you fully cache the data in the memory of the CPU, the GPU utilization is about 75%, which means it's actually stuck at the prepare store, which means uh, bound by the CPU performance. But uh, at the beginning, you can see it's increased the uh, CPU, uh, GPU utilization from the 0% to the 75% take quite a long time, which means actually it uh, takes super long time to warm the data, which causes uh, a lot of uh, uh, resource uh, are waste there. And after you uh, embed the Alasio into this kind of architecture, you can see actually the performance uh, directly jump from the 0% to 75%, and uh, the performance is very consistent in this kind of environment. And the second problem is like previously, you have to do the data replication to guarantee the performance, and uh, they have to do the warm, warm the data before the training. Actually, it's, actually, when you launch the GPU cluster, you have to pay for the money. Then nowadays, you don't need to launch the data to do, uh, launch this cluster to do the warm up. You can just uh, warm up the data and uh, launch the GPU cluster afterward. This is uh, all from uh, our talk from also together with Chen. Uh, is there any question uh, from the audience? Great. Um, thank you, Xue and Chen. Um, yeah, maybe w one quick question and then we'll move on because I know we're running a little, little bit behind. Yeah, go for it. So I'm curious in your research uh, which was very thorough, incidentally. Uh, have you looked at uh, some of the kernel, you know, the Linux features like Cache Files D, for example, that lets you cache NFS or SIFS data locally to see if something that's maybe less intrusive or, or less complex as the product displayed here, but still gives you good uh, returns on your on your performance? Great. Um, actually, the next speakers are just getting mic'd up, so uh, if, if people do have more questions, let's let's do them. Anyone? Hands up. Yeah. How much work is necessary in uh, enhancing the Kubernetes scheduler for uh, data locality, or is a lot of this handled through like this the CSI in those items? Uh, also give a quick uh, answer for this one. Actually, because uh, Kubernetes itself don't provide data locality scheduler, which means uh, like uh, maybe you can provide the IP for the host machine, and uh, the company framework also have to aware of this kind of change and uh, give it back to them. Actually, previous we do a lot of work to enable this, but actually the difficult part is you also have to uh, push into the company framework to make their scheduler to aware of this kind of change. So that's also another reason we want to use Fuse here, because actually for the Fuse itself, we can guarantee the data locality from the long running process. Mm -hmm. Great. Any final questions? Perfect. Right, another round of applause then. Thank you.